Amen. Turn us up just a little. Hallelujah. Are we here yet? Precious Savior. Well, hallelujah. Maybe I'll have to raise my volume a little. Okay, I think we're, we're coming through now. Precious Savior. It's good to be in the house of the Lord tonight. And uh, I'm going to take a text over in Mark, the 14th chapter. But uh, before I do, now I used to would say while well, you're turning, but uh, that doesn't work anymore, does it? Uh, how many brought your Bible tonight? <laughs> okay, praise the Lord. There's more than I suspected. Praise the Lord. But uh, we're all looking forward to next week when the uh, teen camp and the children's camp, it's a combination camp this year, is that right? Begins Monday, is that right? The 5th. And of course, I'm not going to announce the check-in dates and all that kind of stuff. But uh, just a couple of days ago, I, I just was working there in the office and, and writing and so on. But I began to sense that it, it's God's purpose, it's God's purpose to pour out His Spirit at the camp this year. I believe it's His purpose every year, but I, I, I feel something special about this. And we saw Monday in a memorial service, what God would do if we just worship God in the Spirit and rejoice in Jesus Christ. And I know that, that this is for all the way from little children up through teens, and it's somewhat different ministry. But if we'll seek, if we'll seek the focus, the spiritual focus on uh, on the Lord Jesus Christ and, and all that He has done for us and our Father, our Father and, and all that He's done for us in, in Jesus Christ and so forth. I can't instruct anybody about how to teach or how to preach children else I'd be over there doing it. And I've avoided that for many, many years. But, uh, and, and I, I can't do it. But I'm just saying, I'm just saying to those of you there that are workers uh, that I believe it's God's intent to pour out His Spirit. To pour out His Spirit. We must give room for the Holy Ghost. If we'll give room for the Holy Ghost, I believe with all my heart that it's His intent to pour out His Spirit. Okay, turning over to Mark, the 19th chapter, or the 14th chapter, I'm sorry. Mark, the 14th chapter, begin at the 32nd verse. And they came to a place which is called Gethsemane. And he saith to his disciples, Sit ye here while I, go, while I shall pray. And he taketh with him Peter and James and John, and begin to be sore amazed and to be very heavy. And he saith unto them, My soul is exceeding sorrowful unto death. Tarry ye here and watch. And he went forward a little and fell on the ground and prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. And he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible unto thee. Take away this cup from me. Nevertheless, not what I will, but what thou wilt. And he cometh and findeth them sleeping. And saith unto Peter, Simon, sleepest thou? Couldest thou not watch one hour? Watch and pray, lest ye enter into temptation. The spirit truly is ready, but the flesh is weak. And again he went away and prayed and spake the same words. When he returned, he found them asleep again, for their eyes were heavy. Neither wist they what to answer him. And he cometh the third time. And saith to them, Sleep on now and take your rest. It is enough. The hour is come. Behold, the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise up, let us go. Lo, he that betrayeth me is at hand. Now, I just read the entire uh, uh, record of, 
of Gethsemane as, as Mark wrote it and recorded it. It's also in Matthew, the 26th chapter, and, and I don't know if, for sure if it's found in other Luke or, or not. I, I'm not for sure. But this is the entire record, but Mark records this in the 36th verse, that when he began to pray, when he started his prayer, he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible in the Take away this cup from me. Nevertheless, not what I will, but what thou wilt. And it's the words, Abba, Father, that I want to look at tonight just a little bit. These words are used three times in the scriptures, and we're going to look at all three of them, you know, in this service. But the word Abba is a Chaldean word for father. Uh, and it was, in, in the Chaldean language, it was Abba, just exactly as we see in the scripture. But the, the, the word father was translated from the Greek word pater, P-A-T-E-R. Maybe I don't pronounce that right, P-A-T-E-R, pater. And uh, Greek, and, and I, I think possibly it's possibly the same or close in, in the Latin even, but it's a Greek word that was used for, for uh, father. And, uh, but both of these words, Abba and father, uh, or Abba and pater, both of them are properly translated as father. But to the Chaldean, it was, which was a, a, a secular a secular nation, not, not as the uh, Jews that spoke the Greek language, but the, 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 the Abba, the Abba was, uh, uh, was a, a, a father in that culture that required great respect and obedience and submission and honor given unto, unto uh, the father. Now I know that... Uh, I know that some people in the past couple of generations have translated this as uh, Abba Father as being Daddy God, you know, and, and they, they, they paint a picture of a sugar daddy, that if you crawl up in his lap and start calling him Daddy, Daddy God, you know, that you can get anything out of him, but, but it's, it's really kind of what, somewhat different than that, because this word speaks of the the, the respect and the honor that is due unto the father. And, uh, it just the, the Chaldean father in, in the case of the language. But when Jesus put these two words together, Abba, Father, uh, in the Syriac language, in, in the Syriac Bible, it was translated, My Lord, My Father. And I, I, I see that. I see that that's what he was expressing. Not only are you my father, but you're my Lord. My Lord, my father. And with those words and approaching him in prayer, he is, he's before he asks a thing, he's totally submitting himself to the will of his father. Abba, father. Given the greatest of respect and honor that was due unto his father and, and speaking it out uh, as he's there in Gethsemane. A and Jesus had something he wanted from his father, but the father had something he wanted from Jesus. And you know, sometimes, sometimes it's a fact that what we want from God and what God wants from us can be a, a little bit different or sometimes a whole lot different, you know, and, and yet so often we can only speak in terms of, of what we want and not what the Father wants. But when he comes to the Father saying, Abba, Father, he is coming in absolute, complete submission to the purpose and the will of his Father even before he asks what he wants. And what he wants is this. He said, all things are possible unto thee. Take away this cup from me. You know, it was the will of, of Jesus that this cup of sufferings and, and the, the crucifixion and the crown of thorns and the, the, the nails in the hands and the feet, and this was the cup 
that he was speaking of, the cup of his sufferings. Take this away from me. Nevertheless, not what I will, but as thou wilt. And this last phrase, not as I will, but as thou wilt, that's included in, con- included in his uh, approach, Abba, Father, Abba, Father. You know, uh, the utmost respect and honor due to his Father presented as he even approaches him. Take away this cup, nevertheless, what I will, but as thou wilt. And, you know, Hebrews tells us uh, over in, well, it's, uh, what is this? I believe it's the seventh chapter of Hebrews, but if it is the seventh chapter of the ninth verse, where it talks about who in the days of his flesh made uh, uh, supplications with strong crying and tears unto him that was able to save him to death from death and was heard in that he feared. And Jesus was fearing when he came to this place at Gethsemane. He was fearing, and a lot of people would be offended at my saying that, but he, he tells us, he tells us in the 34th verse, he said to Peter, James, and John, my soul is exceeding sorrowful unto death. And, uh, and he, he tells them again, he tells them again, uh, 38th verse, after praying for an hour, after praying for a solid hour, he came and he spoke to Peter, woke Peter up and the others. And he said, couldn't you watch with me for one hour? Watch and pray, lest you enter into temptation. The spirit truly is ready, but the flesh is weak. And Jesus is talking about himself. You know, he's ready in the spirit. He wants to do the will that the Father has sent him to do. He wants to do that. And yet his flesh was weak. And it's in that time of weakness, that time of weakness that, that he comes to the Father. Abba, Father, Abba, Father, uh, surrendering, submitting himself to the will of his Father before he asked it the first thing. And, and, and you know, I, I, I realize that, that as a, a child of God, I can tell you there's times, there's times that, that, that we must submit, resubmit, or whatever, you know, ourselves unto the will of the Father. I asked a lady one time, and uh, I don't know if this is kind of off the subject or not, but uh, she thought she was led by the Holy Ghost in the things that she did. And I asked her, have the Holy Spirit ever told you to do something you didn't want to do? She said, well, no. Why would he tell me to do something I didn't want to do? And just plain and blunt, I said, I don't believe that you've ever heard the Holy Ghost speak to you. Because he'll give you things to do that you don't want to do. He will most definitely give you things to do that you don't want to do. And if you want His blessing, it must be Abba, Father. Abba, Father, I submit to Your will. I submit to Your way. I submit to You in all things. And, and that comes down to, to every part of our life and service and existence with the Lord in the day-to-day routine of being a child of God, there must ever be that Abba, Father, Abba, Father, you know, a submission day by day to the the, the purpose and the will of God for us. Now, we may wonder, well, how did Jesus come, you know, after three and a half years to, you know, to to this place that he he could totally submit himself to the Father? I mean, he knew what lay ahead of him by this time. I don't know if he did from the first or not. You know, when the Holy Ghost came upon him, I, I, I know that Jesus did not come into the world with uh, omniscient knowledge, all knowledge. You know, he, 
He didn't know more than any other baby or child and probably teenager growing up other than what he knew from the scriptures, you know, and, and the things that his mother had told him and the experience and so forth. But there came a time, there came a time, maybe it's in, in uh, the, the, the uh, uh, 40 days of temptation at the end when the angels came and strengthened him. But uh, somewhere along the line, the angels of God told him what his mission was, what he was there for, what he was come into the world to do. And throughout his three years of ministry, he well understood why the Father had sent him into the world. It had everything to do with that cross, to die on that cross, to lay his life down on that cross, a ransom for many. But uh, we, we can wonder, well, well, you know, what makes the difference between uh, Jesus and us that, that he could do this in such a horrible time and fearful time and sorrowful time when he's afraid and he's uh, admitting, I'm afraid. I'm afraid of what uh, I'm facing, you know, but yet submitting, Abba, Father, full, complete submission. I want to go back or actually forward in the scriptures to the, to the epistles and uh, and in, in the epistles, uh, in the fourth chapter, in, in the fourth chapter of Galatians, first verse, now I say that the heir, as long as he's a child, differs nothing from a servant, though he be Lord of all, but is under tutors and governors until the time appointed of the Father. Even so we, when we were children, we're in bondage under the elements of the world. But when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth His Son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. Now, sometimes the Scriptures get a little bit confusing as you read on through them. But I note that from the first verse through the fifth verse is talking to the Jews. It's talking to the Jews in the first verse through the fifth verse. But in the sixth verse, he says, and because ye are sons, he starts talking to the believing Gentiles in the sixth verse. And because ye are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Wherefore thou art no more a servant, but a son, and if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. And how do I know that it's talking about to the Gentiles in this second part here? How be it then, when you knew not God, you did service to them which by nature are no gods. They've been idol worshipers. They were servants to idols. They were slaves to idols. But the Jew had been a slave to Moses and the law. That they were servants. They were servants. And as long as they were a child, they're no different from a servant. And really, really, in what was called their childhood under the law, they were no different than the Gentiles who worshipped demon gods. That, that's actually proven in uh, Ephesians, Ephesians, the uh, third chapter. Uh, and, and, uh, and, oh my, I'm not looking for Ephesians, I'm looking for Romans. Yeah, Romans, the third chapter. Praise God. And, and, and in the third chapter, and the first verse, he said, What vantage in hath a Jew? What profit is their circumcision? Much in every way, chiefly, because unto them, talk about the Jews, were committed the oracles of God. And then in the ninth verse, What then? Are we, the Jew, better than they, the Gentile? No, in no wise, in no way, for we bore both proof both Jews and Gentiles, 
that they're all under sin. Well, over here, over here back in Galatians, the fourth chapter, that the heir, as long as is a child, differs nothing from a servant. There's no difference between the Jew under the law and the Gentile under the demon religions. None whatsoever. You can go back to the third chapter of Romans again and, and follow it through. As is written, there's none righteous. None righteous. None that doeth good. None that seeketh after God. And you read it on through. It says we know that whatsoever the law says, it says to the they that are under the law, the Jew, that, that the whole world may be found guilty before God. Praise God. And, 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 and they proved that all were sinners and all, both Jew and Gentile, were under sin. So here, here in this Galatians, the fourth chapter, the heir as long as the child. That's talking about the Jew. Under the law of Moses, no different from a servant. No different, no different than the Gentile nations that were under their uh, demon worship and, and laws. And so they're no different, no better in any way. The law could not justify in any possible way. But he went on to say, but even so we, when we were children, were in bondage under the elements of the world. And there he's talking about the, the law of Moses. But when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth his son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law. Fourth verse. I want you to notice the words, God sent forth his son. He sent forth his son. The word speaks of a, of a mission, an authority that was given to him, sent forth to accomplish, to accomplish a task. That, that's what this sent forth. It, it wasn't that, uh, it, you know, that, that he came up out of Galilee to be baptized of John and to go on about his business, but he was sent forth. He was sent forth, and when he was sent forth, uh, immediately he was tested in the wilderness, and he overcame uh, Satan. In the temptation, repeatedly, every temptation, he overcame by the word of God, by what is written, he overcame. Came back out of that wilderness in the power of the Holy Ghost and began to, to do the will of his Father. He was anointed with the Holy Ghost with power. who went about doing good, healing all that were oppressed of the devil. But he was sent forth on a mission that was beyond healing the sick and casting out devils and, and feeding the, the multitudes and so forth. His mission was the cross. His mission was to make an end of sins. His mission was to take away the sin of the world. To put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. That was his mission. And that's what it means where... God sent forth His Son in the fullness of the time. The fullness of the time was the time that was given by Gabriel in the 70 weeks prophecy back in, in Daniel 9 and 24 through 27. It gave the exact year that God would send forth His Son on that mission into the world to make it end. It gave that very year in that fullness of time God sent forth His Son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, and He redeemed them through His death on that cross. He shed the blood that would, would destroy, abolish that law, those ordinances that were against man, taking them out of the way, nailing them to His cross. And so, and so he, he says, He sent forth His Son, made of a woman, made under the law to redeem them that were under the law that we might receive the adoption of sons. And because ye are sons, and he's speaking to the Gentiles here, back in the previous chapter, in the previous chapter, he says, 25th verse, after that faith is come, 
You're no longer under a schoolmaster, for you're all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. As many of you as been baptized into Christ have put on Christ, there's neither Jew nor Greek, there's neither bond nor free, there's neither male nor female, for you're all one in Christ. And if ye be Christ, the prep, proper understanding of that is if you be one in Christ, whether you're a Jew or Greek or bond or free, or whether you be male or female, if you be one in Christ, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. And that's where he leaps off into that fourth chapter, praise God, where he sent forth his son in the fullness of times to redeem them that were under the law that we might receive the adoption of sons. And because you Gentiles are sons, going back over that, that uh, third chapter, for you're all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. Have you received Jesus Christ by faith? Have you believed the true report? Have you believed the gospel of Christ? Have you believed it? Do you believe that He shed blood to wash us from our sins? Do you believe that He was the Lamb of God to take away the sin of the world? And the sin of the world speaks of the, the nature of sin that entered through Adam's transgression. And Jesus, the second man, the last Adam, laid down His life to take that nature away out of our hearts and take it away. Do you believe that? Because that's what it is to say, ye are all the children of God through faith in Jesus Christ. It's not that I repeated a sinner's prayer with somebody. It's not that I uh, uh, mouthed the words that I believe that Jesus is the Son of God. I believe that God raised Him from the dead. And somebody says, well then, you're saved if you believe that. Oh no, it's so much more than that. Praise God to believe through faith in Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. But he said, you're all the children of God through faith in Jesus Christ. And he's speaking to Jew and Gentile, bond and free and male and female. For you're all one in Christ Jesus. And if you're one in Christ Jesus, you're Abraham's seed. All of you. And heirs according to the promise. Then he says, then his, and because you are sons, building upon the last few verses of that previous chapter, because you are sons, because you are sons, you have believed, you've trusted, praise God, you, you, you are sons through faith in Jesus Christ. It says, God has sent forth the Spirit of His Son into your hearts. I want you to notice the word sent forth again. That's two verses after it says he sent forth, he sent forth his son made of a woman, made of the law to redeem them, re sent him forth on a mission. He sent forth his son on a mission. Well, here it said, because your sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, what? Abba. Father, Abba, Father. And, you know, I've always looked at this too weakly. I'm not saying every seven days. I'm, not, I'm saying W-E-A-K, weekly. You know, I mean, as when, when you receive Christ, and I believe this, when the Spirit of the Son comes in, He's crying, He's crying for the Father. You know, he, He's crying for the, and I do believe this. But, the scripture says, the scripture says that God has sent forth the spirit of his son. Sent him forth on a mission. Not into the world to die on a cross to take away the sin of the world. But has sent forth the spirit of his son into our hearts. Into our hearts. Whereby we cry, Abba, Father. 
whereby we, whereby we give the due honor and glory hell, and respect unto our Father, the Father of the Lord Jesus Christ and our Father, whereby we approach Him in absolute submission to His purpose and His will, whether we like it or not. You know, I said, whether we like it or not, you know, do we, do we come with Abba, Father, Abba, Father, you know, complete and full submission unto the Father. Praise God. He said He sent forth the Spirit of His Son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father, over in, in Romans in Romans, the uh, eighth chapter, and, I, and I, I know it's the ninth verse, but let me flip over there just for a second. And uh, he, he says this, if, Now if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he's none of his. If any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he's none of his. Is this saying more? Then saying, if Christ is not in your heart, you're not His. Well, that would be true. That would be true if it's if it's Christ is not in your heart. But but Paul said, he said, I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth. Now wait a minute. He he said, I'm not living. I say I live, but I'm not living. Christ liveth. Christ is my life. Christ liveth in me. Christ liveth His life in me. You know, because ye are sons, God has sent forth the Spirit of His Son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father, full submission, total submission to your will and to your way. Praise God. And He sends forth the Spirit of His Son into our hearts. And what does the Spirit of His Son do? It cries, Abba, Father. Full submission. Full submission. The same thing the Son did in Gethsemane. The Spirit of the Son does the same thing in us. Does the same thing in us. Praise God. But uh, if any have not the Spirit of Christ, he's none of his. Oh my, oh my. That, that's, that's a hard saying because the Spirit of the Son is crying, Abba, Father. Full submission, people. Full submission to the Lord to His will and to His way and to His purpose for us. Praise God. The old song we sing, Where He leads me, I will follow. Follow all the way. And doesn't it say something about lead me through the garden? I don't know. But it's not talking about, uh, you know, a, a lovely rose garden. It's talking about Gethsemane. You know, I'll go with Him. With Him. All the way. But nevertheless, he said, if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he's none of his. What is the Spirit of Christ? Well, we know, of course, it's the Spirit of his Son. But what is the Spirit of Christ? When Christ came into the world, he said, sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not. But a body hast thou prepared me. I've come to do thy will, O God. Is that not the Spirit of Christ? Come to do thy will, O God. Hell, is not that not the Spirit of Christ? Praise the Lord. And, and so, if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he's none of his. Well, we can break all this down into theological terms. And we can say, well, but you know, uh, that's just the way God sees us. He sees us. 
as obedient children while we're still disobedient. You know, he sees us as holy when we're still unholy. He sees us. Oh, that's such a horrible deception that's been put over in the church in the last several generations. So, such a horrible thing. You know, I've, I've watched, and I, I'm going to call a name because I, I believe it's good on his part. I've watched Jimmy Swaggart try to understand more than in the past. I saw him teach it once on, uh, on, on 1 Corinthians, this a couple of months ago, 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 11, where it says, Such were some of you, but you are washed, but you are sanctified, but you are justified. And, and, and he, he began to teach it totally different than I'd ever heard him say. He wasn't saying God sees you as just when you're unjust. He sees you as innocent when you're not, not, when you're not innocent. You know, he wasn't saying that. But he's saying this is the proper order that we're, we're washed, we're sanctified, and we're justified. And God never calls something clean before he cleanses it. We must be washed. He was absolutely correct. I think maybe got it out of the book, The Mystery of Justification which went out about 30 days before. Nevertheless, I hope he got it straight from God. Nevertheless, you know, they heard that on his program. And the next time I heard him minister, they took it and said, but that's just the way God sees us. That's our position. We got to get in the process to raise our uh, condition up to our position. That's a lie. That's a lie. He washed us. He sanctified us. And He justified us. And those that are washed are, are sanctified. And those that are sanctified are also justified. Praise the Lord. It's a complete work. It's a complete work. Praise God. But if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, crying, Abba, Father. He's none of His. If Christ be in you, Body's dead because of sin, but the Spirit is life because of righteousness. But the Spirit of Him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you. He that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by His Spirit that dwelleth in you. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh to live after the flesh. For if you live after the flesh, you shall die. If you do your own thing, you shall die. If you come to Gethsemane and take the way out, you shall die. If you come to Gethsemane and stay in, you're going to die. <laughs> Hallelujah. But one, one brings redemption to the whole world, you understand? But we seek our own way out and we die. We die spiritually. And nevertheless, he said, we're debtors not to the flesh to live after the flesh. For if you live after the flesh, you shall die. But if ye through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. Now this word deeds, in this 13th verse, I didn't mean to get into all these things. But it's not like the word deeds is used any place else in, in the Scriptures. You know, this, this word deeds was, was translated from a Greek word that's spelled praxis. P-R-A-X-S, X-X-I-S, praxis. And it speaks of an office, it, it practice. Uh, when we were in high school, I, maybe nobody else can remember those days. Well, my wife could, I guess. But we were taught two different ways that you could spell practice, the word practice. They only give you one way today. And I think it's P R A C. T-I-S-E. Is that, is that how you say C-E? Okay. C-E. And that's practice, to do something repeatedly, repeatedly. But the other was spelled P-R-A-C-T-I-S-E, and it was a doctor's practice. It was a law practice. It was the office, a, a dental practice. You know, it, it was the office. And, uh, and, and, and that's what was used here when he said, if you through the Spirit do mortify the office of the body. And I'm going to tell you that before the Holy Ghost comes in, the body is the office that the flesh operates in. It's the, it's the office of the flesh. 
It's, it's, it, it's, it, it's where the flesh operates, you know. But when the Holy Ghost comes in, the office of the body is mortified, destroyed, killed. And what does the body become? It becomes the temple of the Holy Ghost. Can you see the difference? But he says, if ye through the Spirit do mortify the office of the body where the flesh operates and works, ye shall live. But if you, if you live after the flesh, ye shall die. If the flesh stays in control, you know, if the body's just an office, a place for the flesh to work, you die. But if it's a, if it's a temple of the Holy Ghost, oh my, you live. Hallelujah. And what life it is when this body becomes the temple of the Holy Ghost and not the office of the flesh. Okay. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. Hallelujah. That word led means to bring forth. There's so many ways that you could translate this, you know, and, and, and maybe be correct. To bring forth. You know, the, the word born, it means brought forth. How many do that? You're brought forth from your mother's womb. That's a birth. You know, as many as are brought forth. You could say as many as are born of the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. That makes sense, doesn't it? As many as are led by the Spirit of God, uh, they are the sons of God. And that's as many as the Spirit brings forth in this life. You know, lead. You know, they are the sons of God. Or it could be the person that, that, that brings forth the Spirit of God, that wherever they are, there is the Spirit. Do you know there's people like that? There's people that have His abiding presence. They're full of the Holy Ghost, and His presence was with them 24 hours a day. And wherever they are, there is the Spirit of God. And, you know, because, because they... They are full. They're abiding. The Spirit is abiding in them and they bring forth. I'm not going to finger point one of these and say how that it is. But praise God, as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. I was thinking about, I was thinking about the children of Israel, you know, refusing to hear the voice of God, you know, in the, the wilderness and how that they missed out on that great promise that was given to them in the 19th chapter of uh, Exodus, I believe it's the 5th verse, that if you'll obey my voice and keep my covenant, ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests, a peculiar treasure of all people, for all the earth is mine. Ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. Praise God. If they would simply obey His voice and, and keep His covenant, but they refused the voice of God. But when God said, this is the covenant that I'll make with them in those days, I'll write my laws in their hearts. I'll put it on their inward parts. I was there in the office working the other day, and I began to hear this. His voice is inside of us. His voice. Not just His laws, but His voice is inside of us. Uh, Paul would ask the Ephesians, fourth chapter I think it is, if so be you've learned Christ, if you've been taught by Him, if you've heard Him, praise God. Well, if you've heard Him, where was He speaking? Praise God. His voice is inside of us. It's not laws written like on parchment. It's not laws written, you know, like uh, by ink upon fleshy tables of the heart as, as Paul spoke of in, 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 what is it, 2 Corinthians, the third chapter, I think it is. But nevertheless, nevertheless, his voice is speaking in us. If so be, we're his children full of the Holy Ghost. His law written in our heart. 
one of the Old Testament prophets prophesying of this new covenant, he said, you'll hear a voice speaking behind you saying, this is the way, walk ye in it. But that voice is not speaking behind us, it's speaking within us. Hallelujah. As the children of God. And so, as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. I've seen so many trying to hear, trying to hear, cupping their ears, God speak to me, you know. Uh, <laughs> you know, because trying to be led. I think he said, if you think he said, he didn't. I said, if you think he said, he didn't. You're going to make a mistake if you think he said and act upon it. Praise God. God is well able to let you know what he has spoken. Praise God. He's well able for you to know when he's spoken. And I'm going to tell you something else. When he has spoken to you, everybody else is going to know that he's spoken to you. They're going to know, precious Savior. They're going to know. It's not just that we're full of information that we can, that we can put it out, you know, and, and just, just boom, 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 boom. You know, I admire that. I admire that. But, but one thing, in my old age, I've discovered that can't happen if it's not the Holy Ghost today. If it's, it, it can't happen. Nevertheless, many led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For you've not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you've received the spirit of adoption whereby we cry, Abba, Father. And you know, this is, this is talking to the Jews here. This is the Jews. It talks about you've not received the spirit of bondage again to fear. And that was the law of Moses. That was Moses' law. You've not received that again. To fear, the spirit of bondage to fear, but you've received the spirit of adoption whereby we cry, Abba, Father. And the placing of sons is what this word adoption means. The placing of sons. That spirit, you've received that spirit whereby you are placed as a son of God. Hallelujah. Not the spirit of bondage. Not... Moses and the law, you know, if you're a Jew. Not, to, not some heathen religion or ordinance if you're a Gentile, but the spirit of adoption, the spirit, you've received the spirit that places you as a son of God, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. And here again, this is the very beginning. Notice, is at the end of Christ's ministry, that he's crying, Abba, Father! And it's the first words <laughs> of that newborn child of God that's crying, Abba, Father, Abba, Father, Abba, Father. Full submission. Full submission. Precious Savior, thy will, not my will, be done. That's not something that's learned that is it something that's learned. But sometimes it takes a long time for people to learn in the gospel. You understand? Praise God. I would that I had understood March 9th, 1958, the gospel as I understand it today. Oh, such heartache and heartbreak and sorrow. I and many, many others would have been spared if I'd have understood from that first day, but I'm going to tell you that first day, the Spirit came in crying, Abba, Father. Came in crying, Abba, Father, in full submission with joy and peace and righteousness in the Holy Ghost and the fruit of the Spirit in full bloom. Precious Savior. Precious Savior. But, but you know, we go through things in life. You know, and, and any number of people have went through a, a horrible several months of things that, that we had to go through. You know, and I came to a place uh, two weeks ago that I'd just soon die as to live. 
In fact, I was dying. I was dying. The Spirit of God spoke to me and said, but you've got a race to run. You've got a faith to keep. You've got to, a course to finish. And what did I have to do? Not consciously, until I saw this today. Abba, Father. Abba, fa yes, Father. Yes, Father. I'll stand up and I'll run again. <laughs> and I'll keep the faith and I'll finish the course. Precious Savior, I'll do that. Hallelujah. But I won't have to do it with my strength because it's His Spirit that sent forth crying, Abba, Father. When we submit ourselves to Him, it's His Spirit that's come, hallelujah, to do the work in us, through us, precious Savior, for the people, to speak to the people. But He said, You've not received the spirit of bondage again to fear. We don't serve God as slaves. We don't serve God through Moses or any other law or personality. We simply don't do it. But we serve God through Jesus Christ. God has sent forth the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father, praise God. And we've received the spirit of adoption whereby we cry, Abba, Father, Abba, Father, precious Savior. You know, I believe there may be people in some area of life that's in what we call their Gethsemane. Their Gethsemane. You know the will of God in a matter, but it's not your will. You know the will of God. In, you know the will of God. In, you're not guessing. You know. You try to avoid the will of God in, in whatever the matter is. You try to avoid the will of God. But you know the will of God. You know, praise God, the will of God. And it's your Gethsemane. It's your Gethsemane. You know, and it, it's there that that on one hand you want to be pleasing to God in everything. On the other hand, you want your way and, and, and your will. You want to plan your own future and do your own thing. But that may not be the way that God has planned for you. Praise God. He sends forth the Spirit of His Son into our hearts in full submission to live his life in us and through us. And you'll never find more happiness, never find more happiness in this life than you will in the perfect will of God. Hallelujah. The scripture tells us over in Romans 12 and 1, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God that you present yourselves living sacrifices unto yourselves unto God, a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Present what He has saved, what He has sanctified. You present it to Him for His service, which is our reasonable service. We present it to Him for His will, for His way, you know, for whatever he has called us to. Not everybody has the same calling. Not everybody's so blessed to be filled and anointed with, with a powerful anointing of God. There are those that would, the old saying is, give their right arm to have what God has freely given to another. And yet, and yet if that other despises it, they'll lose it. They'll lose it. And there'll come a time they'll desperately want it and can't retrieve it. I'm not saying, talking about being lost. I'm talking about the will and the purpose of God. Hallelujah. But you'll never be so happy. He said, he said be, 
not conform to this world, continue with it, present your bodies a living sacrifice. Be not conformed unto this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your minds that you may know what is that good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. And right now, the will of God may be what you don't want. It may be what you don't want, but the will of God is what you desperately must have. Because if you have your will, you're going to lose everything. If you have your will, you're going to lose everything. But the will of God. And he said that you know what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. I knew some people one time and they said, we're not in the perfect will of God. We're in the acceptable will of God. We, you know, we're, if we was in the perfect will of God, we'd be over missionaries over in Africa or someplace wherever they said. But we're in God's acceptable will of God. And what were they doing? They were working on a job and they were living for themselves and doing their own thing and maybe teaching a Sunday school class. And, uh, and, and you're telling me that the will of God for me is to be this, but it's acceptable with God if I do that. But what he said, what he called the good, the acceptable, and the perfect will of God is that it's good for you, it's acceptable unto you, and it's perfect for you when you find it. When you find it, when you surrender to it, it's good. Oh, it's so good. It's so good, so acceptable, and so perfect. Precious Savior. Hallelujah. To be in His will. Nevertheless, Jesus said, He begins with, Abba, Father. Showing the utmost respect and honor due unto him. And then, not my will, but thine be done. Hallelujah. And he sends his, I can't get away from it, the spirit of his son into our hearts to do it. God bless you. Let's stand together. And Precious Savior, if you know the will of God concerning your life...